The Scandies Rose, a crab vessel known in the industry for its stability, was the type of fishing boat deckhands would strive to work for. Known in local circles as the battleship or the tank, this vessel, like many other reputable workhorses in Alaskan crab fishing, earned the nicknames through decades of survival and success in brutal conditions. These conditions are unpredictable and can have deadly consequences, even for the most seasoned mariners. Laid down by Bender Shipbuilding out of Mobile, Alabama, launched in 1978 and originally named Enterprise, the boat was built for one purpose, pot fishing. Pot fishing vessels require expansive decks that will be loaded and offloaded constantly, stacked as high as the ship's bridge. Most importantly, their ability to remain stable being crucial throughout these operations. Crab season frequently sees these boats pushed hard through high seas, difficult navigation, freezing temperatures, and an often underestimated silent killer, the buildup of ice. The Enterprise would change hands in 1989, renamed to the Scandies Rose. Owned and operated by Scandies Rose Fishing Company, LLC, it was essentially a one-ship company, common in the world of crab fishing. At a length of 130 feet, or 39.6 meters, the Scandies Rose would also feature a width or beam of 34.6 feet, a draft depth of about 11.3 feet, and a gross tonnage of 195. Powered by twin Detroit diesel 12-cylinder engines, total horsepower would be about 1,610, or 805 horsepower to each screw. This setup providing enough maneuverability to navigate unforgiving Alaskan waters. With no major incidents to speak of prior to December 2019, and only minor modifications during routine repairs, the Scandies Rose remained mostly as built throughout its life. The vessel had seen operation in waters like the Puget Sound, Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska, and was the subject of Episode 8 in Season 16 on Deadliest Catch, airing June 2, 2020. The Scandies Rose was captained by 45-year fishing veteran Gary Cobbin Jr. Part owner of the boat, Cobbin was a man known by his colleagues as a great captain that was surprisingly safety conscious and the most experienced fisherman they'd ever met. He saw frequent success in Alaskan waters, the ship and captain well known to the industry and enthusiasts alike. In spring of 2019, the vessel received a thorough valuation by independent third party, Fisherman's Maritime Services Incorporated. The Scandies Rose hauled out at Loverick Shipyard near Seattle for dry dock inspection, then floated in freshwater nearby for service suitability. The vessel's owners, considering the boat's sale, needed to determine market value prior to moving forward. These inspection companies check vessels like these professionally, from stem to stern, electronics to engines, toilets and plumbing to decking, every corner and weld inspected and conditions evaluated. The total market value determined after a three month long process to be $3.5 million, the value which should sell for, but a replacement value of 15 million if lost. In fact, noted by the inspection company, the vessel is well constructed with very good scantlings and workmanship. The construction of this vessel is extraordinary for a boat built by Bender Shipbuilding during the late 1970s. The craftsmanship, materials, and design are on par with the best of the West Coast built fishing boats. Starting Sunday, December 29, in the Kodiak port, preparations for what was to be a cod and opelio crab fishing voyage began. Aboard were Captain Cobbin and six crew members, one acting as engineer, another as deck boss, and the remaining four as deck hands. The crew's experience ranging from brand new to 20 years in fishing and seafaring. The captain's son among them, David Lee Cobbin. They would use the next day and a half prepping the vessel for a planned departure of Monday the 30th. Their destination, fishing grounds in the Bering Sea on the north side of the Aleutian Islands, a roughly two to three day journey. The cod and opelio, or snow crab season, set to open Wednesday, January 1st, and last roughly two to three weeks. This New Year season bringing numerous boats out to get their share. During the nearly two day prep, 195 crab pots were stacked and secured, groceries and potable water brought aboard, fuel holds filled, bilge pumps checked, hatches tightened, bait stocks replenished, and the vessel prepped according to US Coast Guard stability specifications. On Monday the 30th, the captain covered safety drills with the crew, providing instructions on donning survival suits, fire suppression, life raft locations and operation, the location of the vessel's emergency position indicating radio beacon, or EPIRB, 
and how to perform mayday calls using comms equipment on the bridge. Crew members would describe Captain Coppin's routine safety drills as very thorough. The crew also discussed weather forecasts along their proposed route and utilized the Windy app to receive forecast info. The captain and crew knowing the weather was, quote, going to be bad. The forecast called for heavy gales and warnings for heavy freezing spray. However, rough weather is generally the norm for these mariners, and these areas in the Gulf of Alaska are notorious for it. In fact, several other vessels would leave out that same evening regardless. The Scandies Rose got underway from the port at Kodiak by 8.35 p.m. Monday, December 30th. The intended route would see the vessel pass through Kupriyanov Strait, then southwest toward the Shelikov Strait, and on through False Pass, opening to Bechevin Bay, and ultimately the Bering Sea. On a steady southwesterly course at a speed of 8 to 10 knots, the captain would be at the helm in six-hour shifts, each remaining crew member alternating in for one-hour shifts each, covering the opposite six while the captain rests. Then the rotation would repeat. These vessels often maintain such schedules to allow ample rest time, but also because mariners aboard typically need to gain crucial experience in all manner of seafaring. Each vessel may have their own variation, but in general, deckhands are expected to wear many hats, as it were, each crew member also making the rounds at the end of each watch to ensure engines, auxiliary equipment, and other systems are in good working order. Ice accumulation in these waters is common. Although difficult to fully predict, it was thought to be factored in when using those predetermined stability calculations. When freezing spray from wind and waves begins to accumulate, the gathering ice becomes heavy, changing the center of gravity, creating weight imbalances, causing heavy lists, even capsizing and sinking vessels. Although commercial fishing deaths in U.S. waters have been declining steadily over the past few decades, the dangers are ever-present. The FV Destination, a fishing boat similar to the Scandies Rose, capsized and sank and lost all souls aboard in February of 2017. The vessel found by investigators to have been overcome by ice accumulation on its fishing pot stack, leading to a deadly, unrecoverable list. In icing conditions, the mesh of fishing pots acts as a sort of catch net, increasing accumulation drastically. After a long investigation, though, it was also found that the destination had left port overloaded, its stability compromised beforehand. Stability, or to oversimplify, a vessel's ability to remain upright and not roll over, plays a crucial role in the world of shipping, and understanding it is vital for any master and crew, from the smallest rowboat to the largest container ships. The combination of ballast water, fuel and oil acting as ballast, securing cargo, the overall load carried on decks before, during, and after weight change, load shift, fishing, stacking, unloading, all these factors must be accounted for in maintaining stability especially crucial if the vessel is meant to navigate rough waters. These fishing boats and their crews make their living navigating rough waters. Captain Cobbin took over the watch the next morning, 8 a.m., Tuesday, December 31st. The weather living up to predictions. Deckhands reported a couple waves over the bow throughout the night and freezing spray accumulating to about an inch thick on the starboard side of the pot stack. The crew noting that it was not enough to require removal yet and many captains in the industry stating they don't attempt ice removal until at least a few inches have gathered, that, quote, anything less would be too difficult and time-consuming to remove. Ice removal also requires the vessel be idle and somewhat sheltered, like a cove or natural bay, ensuring spray is reduced in the meantime, pointing into the wind and minimizing dangers to the crew as they negotiate icy, exposed decking, climbing over and maneuvering around pot stacks wielding heavy tools like sledgehammers in efforts to break it off. Despite the poor conditions, the vessel maintained an even keel, the winds at an approximate 30 to 50 knots, with 20 to 30 foot seas. The Scandies Rose had transited the Shelikoff Strait, entering more open waters. At 11.18 a.m., the captain placed a call via satellite phone to the fishing vessel Amatuli. The Amatuli was en route to Dutch Harbor. Several hours prior, it had made the same journey but chose to navigate around Kodiak Island to the south due to differences in tides. The Amatuli's captain, majority and managing owner of the Scandies Rose, spoke with Captain Cobbin for about 12 minutes. The conversation, however, was fairly unremarkable, the only reference to conditions being the Amatuli's captain 
stating they pulled into a sheltered cove briefly as the weather was, quote, foul. Captain Cobbin, remarking at the end of their call, only that it was, quote, very cold, his vessel was experiencing light icing, and the sea conditions were poor. Again, for fishing operations like these, though, just another day at the office. At about 2 p.m., the captain ended his watch and the Scandies Rose crew began their six-hour rotation. The vessel's average speed had slowed a bit from about 8 to 6.5 knots, but was still maintaining a steady course to the southwest. Weather conditions deteriorated throughout the afternoon. The vessel churning its way through high seas, the spray increasing from both worsening weather and the bow crashing through wave after wave, this spray freezing and ice accumulating further. By 7.15 p.m., a crew member woke the captain for his evening watch. Once on the bridge, the two discussed the deteriorating conditions. The vessel had developed a two-degree list to starboard due to ice buildup on the pot stacks and superstructure. At this point, though, two degrees was not exactly concerning. More importantly, ice buildup was at roughly two inches, and the vessel could correct this by transferring fuel within tanks. The fuel already acts as ballast, and shifting it to maintain stability, temporarily, while not ideal, is also somewhat commonplace, especially under the circumstances. The boat's engineer already assuming it would be needed before the captain even asked. By most industry standards, fellow captains and peers agreed they'd have made the same decision to press on. At about 8 p.m., Captain Cobbin called a friend in North Carolina to wish her a happy new year. She didn't hear anything alarming by the sound of his voice, and that he only casually mentioned the vessel was icing, had a slight list, and they would eventually need to tuck in someplace safe. Shortly after, roughly eight miles northeast of Sutwick Island, Captain Cobbin called the Amatuli once again. The Amatuli was just about to enter Dutch Harbor now, the two men discussed the weather, Scandy's rose condition, and the captain of the Amatuli advising Cobbin to, quote, be cautious, the call not overtly concerning in nature. The wind howling at an approximate 60 to 70 knots or more now, temperatures around 12 degrees, and seas 30 feet or more, the Scandy's rose starboard list had rapidly increased to about 20 degrees, enough to warrant the vessel make for the closest shelter they could find. At around 8.40 p.m., five and a half miles due east of Sutwick Island. Captain Cobbin called the fishing vessel Pacific Sounder. The Sounder was currently in the Bering Sea, preparing to fish for cod. Its captain, longtime friend of Cobbin and fellow fisherman, stated the Scandies Rose captain was concerned about a 20 degree list and that icing was really bad. But also the Cobbin stated it was too rough to send the crew out and break ice, that he was going to try and seek shelter southeast of Sutwick Island. However, the Sounders captain noted the Cobbin's tone wasn't that of any urgency, even following up with casual conversation about the recent holidays and small talk about vessel ownership, at which point the Sounders captain needed to end the roughly 30 minute long chat at 9.10 p.m. so he could tend to his own vessel's generator in the engine room. 9.45 p.m. and automatic identification systems or AIS showed the Scandies Rose transponder two and a half miles south of Sutwick Island turned about 50 degrees to starboard, the vessel altering to a northwesterly course toward the refuge of Sutwick's natural southern bays. The captain on the Pacific Sounder had completed his task in the engine room at about the same time, 9.45 p.m., when he decided to call Captain Cobbin back. He grew instantly concerned when the veteran captain's normally stoic tone had changed, telling him worriedly, I don't know how this is going to go. The list has gotten a lot worse. The connection was abruptly cut, and the Sounders captain attempted to call back ten or more times, but the system could not connect. On board the Scandies Rose, icing had become so overwhelming on the starboard side, after what was thought to be sudden bursts of even more violent gales, that the now rolling vessel, creaking and groaning under the stress, jolted two crew members from their bunks below decks, friends Dean and John. The vanishing angle of the fishing boat in its current state, or the maximum degree of list after which a vessel becomes unstable and can no longer right itself was approximately 30 to 35 degrees, down considerably from about 40 to 45. When the Scandies Rose was on its southwesterly course, those near hurricane force winds, almost perpendicular to the vessel, were blasting it steadily on the starboard side. Although the winds were causing the accumulation of ice, they were also aiding deceptively in the vessel's ability to remain upright. By the time Captain Cobbin turned toward the bays of Sutwick Island, 
the ice accumulation was enough that it reduced overall stability. The severity of this, though, investigators thought to be obfuscated by those deceiving winds acting as a sort of crutch all along, preventing the list from worsening further before the turn. The turn towards Sutwick brought the prevailing winds and waves from the overloaded starboard side around partially to port. Now, with all forces pushing and acting towards starboard, the vessel was unfortunately doomed. When Dean and John had jumped up from their bunks, rollover was only minutes away. Overhearing that brief, final conversation with the Pacific Sounder, one of the men rushing up to the bridge, yelling to the captain, what is going on? Captain Cobbin responding, flustered, I don't know, I don't know, I think we're sinking. The deckhand yelled down to his friend in the stateroom, the boat is sinking. Everything started happening extremely fast. No alarms had been sounded. The captain would place the mayday call soon after, while crew members scrambled. The two deckhands quickly located their immersion suits in the wheelhouse, helping each other to get them on, and the rest of the crew joined shortly thereafter, all the while the vessel's angle reaching nearly 90 degrees, floors slowly becoming slick walls. Dean and John knew somewhat by instinct at this point that they all needed to abandon ship fast. Helping a couple others with their suits was proving nearly impossible in the confusion and quickly worsening situation. They described the scene as pure chaos. Several of the men still inside screaming, we're gonna die, oh my god, we're gonna die, hyperventilating in sheer panic. John and Dean also quote, freaking out internally, but trying to talk calmly to each other, determined to take those few potential steps toward survival. With their suits on, John then Dean exited via a port side door to get out on deck. The immersion suit's big bulky gloves making it difficult for articulation. The mayday call by Captain Cobbin was broadcast at approximately 9.55 p.m. at some point amidst the chaos and panic screams surrounding him in the wheelhouse. As the rollover continued unabated, the remaining four crew and captain were still inside the bridge, not nearly as collected as the other two. Dean and John repeatedly screaming at them, get out, get out, get the f out of there, the boat's going down. The men scrambling around outside the bridge, trying to find a line or anything to throw down inside and help the others climb up and out of the wheelhouse. But everything, lines, life rings, buoys, everything nearby outside was completely frozen. There was so much ice, nothing was easily accessible. At this point, they both knew they were down from minutes to just a few precious seconds. Captain Gary Cobbin, older than the others and not nearly as able-bodied, lost his footing on the nearly 90-degree decking, and the men could only watch as he tumbled helplessly back across the bridge, striking the opposite side of the wheelhouse. The captain's son David unwilling to leave his side as his father screamed in pain. They saw one other crew member, Brock Rainey, had fully donned his survival suit, but didn't make it in time to join the others outside. The two friends now essentially standing on the side of the wheelhouse were determined to remain at least atop the vessel as it completely capsized. The Scandies rose laid further on its side, the lights went out, and they clambered to remain atop the hole as it rolled over. Now completely in darkness, ice everywhere, slipping, stumbling, but trying to stay together, they were immediately swept off the flat side of the hull by a powerful wave. The conditions still deadly with waves 30 foot plus, wind gusts anywhere from 50 to 70 knots. The two became separated, thrown around in their survival suits by the violent, frigid seas, calling out each other's names in the hopes they could reunite. Their suits floating awkwardly as they'd been unable to inflate the bladders around the neck. The suits float on their own without them, but John's head was being dunked repeatedly as his feet floated higher than his head at an awkward angle in the high seas. Dean witnessed the Scandies Row's final moments as John struggled with his own survival suit. The rose briefly stood vertical, bow protruding from the waves, then disappeared straight down. About 20 minutes passed and Dean spotted what looked like the beacon light from a life raft. Still calling out for John while swimming with everything he had, Dean headed toward the enclosed survival raft. Too tired to immediately climb in, but relieved to be near it, he heard John call out in response, approaching the raft from the other side. They both climbed in and took a moment to collect themselves, feeling disbelief they'd made it to this point. The life raft had done its job. This was an eight-person, pod-style raft, built to deploy and float to the surface automatically upon being submerged. 
In addition to the external automatic beacon already lit, it contained other survival supplies inside. The men were aware of this and rummaged around for whatever they could find, hoping to make their presence known through the dark, deadly weather and waves. The beacon outside going dark after only 10 minutes or so. The suits that had saved their lives thus far were also quite cumbersome. Dean struggling with the quote, Gumby gloves, to open the small packages and boxes in the survival kit. The immersion suits being all one piece meant the gloves can't just be removed either. The suits were also allowing enough water inside that the men could feel it, hampering their ability to stay warm and creating extreme discomfort. The raft had steadily been taking on water as well, the seas splashing in and all around, and pieces of survival kit that were on the floor weren't floating. The water deep enough inside the raft now that the two had to submerge themselves to reach all the way down and retrieve stuff, fearing the raft may capsize at any moment as well. It took about an hour, but they finally found what they were looking for, the flare gun kit. They immediately shot all of them off as the kit didn't have many. The lights had gone out on the raft already, and by their knowledge of these waters, if the Scandies Rose Eperb had triggered like it was supposed to, they felt rescue should have arrived toward the end of the first hour. Their decision to fire off all flares was largely for this reason, convinced rescuers should already be within sight. But the first hour became the second, the second became the third. The cold was setting in, the men were soaking wet, frozen, feelings of hope fading into confusion, despair. With repeated unsuccessful attempts to contact the vessel after its mayday, the Coast Guard sent out an urgent broadcast on all relevant frequencies, requesting vessels in the area keep a lookout and report any sightings. When the Coast Guard contacted the fishing vessel Rough and Ready directly via satellite phone, the fishing boat was about 25 miles due west of Scandies Row's last known position, one of the closest in the vicinity, but they were unable to assist due to their own struggle in the abysmal weather conditions. Other vessels potentially within range of the captain's mayday call didn't even receive it since their antennas had iced up and were having troubles of their own. The Coast Guard's MH-60 Jayhawk helicopter would get underway by roughly 11.30 p.m. from Air Station Kodiak, but the Scandies Row's last known position was extremely remote. The weather wasn't going to let up along their flight path either. Extra fuel had to be loaded and additional complexities in flight planning were required. This flight was going to push the rescue helicopter and its crew to the very edge of their range and capabilities. Coast Guard Cutter Mellon was diverted from his patrol near Dutch Harbor as well. The Mellon's ETA roughly 20 hours though. A Coast Guard C-130 was also dispatched from Elmendorf Richardson in Anchorage to aid in search and act as a communications platform. Earlier, once inside their raft, Dean and John had spotted the Scandies Row's second life raft but decided not to risk exiting theirs and just watched it floating nearby for most of those grueling hours waiting for rescue. At roughly the four hour mark, the two men spotted what they first thought was the light from a ship's mast over near the other life raft. They had no flares left, but knew there was a functioning flashlight they'd been saving for this very reason. They began signaling toward the light that appeared to be investigating the other life raft, which turned out to be empty. The light suddenly raised straight up quite a distance and the two deckhands knew instantly it was a Coast Guard helicopter. At 2.08 a.m., Dean and John were pulled up one by one into the Jayhawk. The Coast Guard crew even forced to de-ice the rescue swimmer's goggles and dry suit throughout the process. They'd pushed the helicopter so far it was dangerously low on fuel and had to cut auxiliary power to conserve it, which meant no interior heating for the long ride back to Kodiak Station. Finally landing safely at approximately 3.40 a.m., Dean and John were quickly brought aboard a waiting ambulance and onto the hospital, where they were treated for hypothermia, both making a quick physical recovery. In an interview later, the rescue flight commander stating they were anticipating bad weather, but what they got was a lot worse. It took both pilots to keep the helicopter flying level, stating the 170 mile, two and a half hour journey was the most challenging flight of his career. Dean and John would recount events to interviewers in as much detail as possible, especially in hopes to aid in finding survivors. The ensuing search would cover a 1,400 square mile area, using all potential drift models based on the Scandies Rose final position, on the weather patterns, 
and the two survivors' coordinates. The Coast Guard searching tirelessly throughout New Year's Day. Multiple MH-60 helicopters, C-130s, and then the Cutter Mellon arrived three hours quicker than planned at 4.15 p.m. Searching in these conditions, though, even puts rescue personnel at risk, and the Cutter had to stop for its own ice removal efforts that afternoon. The primary goal of such a high-risk search and rescue puts victim recovery far behind the priority of locating survivors, the likelihood of which dwindling by the hour. And by 6.08 p.m. on January 1st, 20 hours after Captain Cobbins Mayday was received by the U.S. Coast Guard, the search was called off. The investigation that followed was difficult, to put it simply. The owners of the Scandies Rose contracted a firm specializing in underwater survey and salvage. The MV Endurance, a vessel that acts as a platform for high-tech survey equipment and remote-operated vessels, or ROVs, would arrive at the last known coordinates on the morning of Monday, February 10, 2020. Greeted by a diesel fuel sheen on the surface a quarter mile long, the Endurance would use sonar to locate the wreck on the seafloor. The Scandies Rose lay 160 feet deep on its starboard side, bow pointing east. The Endurance, battling rough weather and tidal conditions, would conduct ROV operations in the following two to three days, providing extensive, crucial footage for investigators. The footage helped confirm, rule out, or otherwise answer several factors in the months-long investigation that followed, factors we will touch on shortly. Before the Endurance was forced to depart due to deteriorating weather, the ROV observed two survival suits inside the bridge containing the remains of victims. No other victims or survival suits were found. On May 11, 2020, the Coast Guard sent a letter of presumed death for the captain and four crew members to the victims' families. Now, it's important to note, via thorough investigations, witness interviews, the policies and procedures Scandies Rose had clearly followed throughout its history, the NTSB and Coast Guard ruled out the following. Fatigue. The vessel maintained a sufficient rotation schedule to allow rest periods. Drug and alcohol use. The Scandies Rose had a well-documented no drug and alcohol policy. Survivors Dean and John also adamant in backing this up. Vessel maintenance, propulsion, steering, and hull integrity. The Scandies Rose was well documented to have been maintained in good condition up to and including the incident voyage. Unexpected down flooding, or waves pouring water into openings that lead below decks. This also ruled out as a factor prior to or causing initial severe listing conditions. Any down flooding that occurred was well after the vessel had reached 20 to 30 plus degrees of list. Perhaps most crucially though, ruled out was the crew's loading of fishing pots, vessel stability preparations, and the captain's decision-making. So if these weren't to blame, then what happened? A situation like this is a prime example of the need for proper research, due diligence, and how crucial an agency like the NTSB is. While not perfect, that's part of what makes the due diligence and transparency necessary, because people aren't perfect. No human or group of humans is. There is no pure good or evil, no bright line for right or wrong. We're all caught in the churn, trying to coexist somewhere in the middle. Details, causes, blame can so easily be attributed incorrectly, especially in events that transpired far away from civilization, under the cover of darkness, obscured by terrible weather conditions. In researching this incident, for example, and a major part of why I'm on my soapbox right now, I saw commenters on videos and articles about it, accusing the captain and crew of being drunk, simply dismissing them for taking drugs, or throwing around other baseless accusations with zero attempt at research. Hell, I even fully admit, none of these videos I make should be used as actual research. Proper research and knowing where to look is crucial towards informed decision making. The NTSB and Coast Guard getting to the bottom of the Scandies Rose tragedy was a prime example of finding what really happened amidst so many challenges. Then, using those findings to possibly save more lives in the future. As you'll see, the true culprit they found, while not nearly as headline-worthy, is, without question, deadly. These vessels and their crews don't typically even flinch at the news of ice buildup. One of Cobbin's fellow captains stating, ice is just a constant presence in the Bering Sea in the wintertime. You're not going to go many years without having to chop ice half a dozen times or more. They just get to work removing it and keep going. However, 
what the Scandies Rose was subjected to prior to its turn north was a phenomena referred to by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, as one or multiple Williwas. Dangerous winds that occur mainly along the Aleutian Chain and Gulf of Alaska shores and are influenced by local topography. They're most frequent in winter and are usually the result of air damming up on the windward slopes of mountains. This air spills over in strong gusts on the lee side that lasts only a matter of minutes. However, such winds are violent, often reaching hurricane force, and their onset is sudden, often interrupting periods of near calm conditions. These forces especially intense near the Shelikov Strait and along the Scandies Rose Path. During these conditions, entry well into the bays is necessary for refuge. The vessel had actually accumulated 6 to 15 inches of ice in a very short period. This is a huge amount by anyone's standards. In addition, the captain and crew had loaded 195 fishing pots. This amount, how the pot stack was loaded, the method of securing it, was all according to the Scandies Rose stability calculation instructions set forth by the U.S. Coast Guard. The crew followed these specifications strictly, as they had done for quite some time. These stability calculations were found to be inaccurate the primary culprit of this story. When the Coast Guard's Maritime Safety Center, or MSC, calculates each commercial vessel's stability characteristics, they determine how much a vessel can carry, where and how to load it on deck, empty pots versus full, ballast tank capacities, and so on. In the case of the Scandies Rose, up to and including the year 2019, the following determinations were made. Calculating additional weight of only up to 1.3 inches of ice on horizontal surfaces and 0.65 inches on vertical. A number of captains say they regularly exceed this before they even consider stopping to chop ice. The stability assessment did not accurately model the Scandies Rose shelter and focusal enclosed volumes, the current bulwarks heights, and quote, significantly underpredicted the superstructure windage area, possibly even utilizing older versions of the ship's bulwarks, for example. The NTSB also found the MSC had significant differences of ballast tank volumes in their report versus the vessel's true capacities. This was all in addition to other mathematical errors and omissions by the quote, naval architect who completed the Scandies Rose stability instructions, who had been independently completing vessel stability instructions for about 30 years. These instructions are regularly taken as the final word by mariners when prepping their vessel for upcoming voyages. Following these conclusions, the NTSB recommendations would be to the Coast Guard and their Marine Safety Center, evaluate further the effects of icing on crab pots and pot stacks, especially when accumulated asymmetrically. The regulations at the time assumed even distribution only, and as stated, only up to about 1.3 inches. Apply these and other updated calculations to regulations and oversight programs for fishing vessels going forward. Require owners, shipmasters, and chief engineers of commercial fishing vessels to complete training and demonstrate competency in vessel stability and watertight integrity. Require that all personnel carry manually activated personal locator beacons or PLBs. Ideally, these would be worn at all times by each person working on commercial vessels at sea. Registered individually to each crew member, the system would be more reliable than, for example, the EPIRB that failed to trigger on the Scandies Rose. To the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Improve surface observation capabilities in lacking areas like Sutwick Island and Chignik Bay. To the National Weather Service, bring your website for freezing spray predictions online and promote its use in the industry. And it looks like they may have gotten a start on this since. From the way it looks to me, if it weren't for the captain's mayday call just before the vessel capsized, survivors Dean and John and the fate of the Scandies Rose may have all been lost to the sea without a trace. According to the NTSB, following the sinking of the Scandies Rose, a maritime vocational school in Seattle partnered with one of the vessel's owners and developed an eight-hour-long stability course tailored specifically to crab boats. As of March 2021, the class had been well attended so far, two participating captains remarking they would highly recommend the class, one mentioning he believed the class should be mandatory for all crab boat captains.